Welcome to Extensive Chats. My name is Nana Kesikunse. Today we are talking to a broadcaster, a public relations officer, a Talo scholar, a Mandela Washington fellow, and he's generously called Product of Grace. I wonder how many pages he writes his CV on. Philip Osebons is my guest today. Welcome. Thank you. How many pages do you write your CV? The last time I checked, I did about eight pages. Eight? Yeah. So run us through what goes through the first page, second page, and fifth. So basically for the first page, you know, as usual, the conventional thing, your, your name, the address, and all of that. And then uh, I follow it up with my core competences, you know, before I jump into the relevant skills, employment history, your education background, uh, and of course, one thing I also put premium on is the voluntary scale, some of the voluntary stuff you've done. It's something people leave out from, from their CVs, but it's, 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 it's quite important, you know, so some of the voluntary stuff I've, I've done also appears on my, on my CV. For instance, I serve as the coordinator of the Talo Group Scholarship Scheme Alumni Network, which is purely a voluntary thing. And we organize the regional youth entrepreneurship summit, which is also voluntary. I mean, it's done for free for patrons who, who, who come for that event. So it's something you need to highlight in your, in your, in your CV. And then some of the awards I've, I've, I've been uh, fortunate to receive. You know, I also highlight them and the other professional trainings I've had, I also highlight. So it's quite a comprehensive CV. And yeah. um, so which did you do first, broadcasting or ECG? Which of them, which came first? So after, after uni, I studied linguistics at the University of Ghana and I completed in 2006. So I had my national service and then in late 2007, around November 2007, I joined Sky Media Group initially as a sports presenter, you know, and then I went through the ranks and became the morning show host. So that's like the flagship program on, on, on the station. And then through that, in 2012, I won the Talo Group Scholarship Scheme Scholarship to study for my master's degree in the UK. And I studied for an MSc in Corporate Communications and Public Affairs. So after that, I told myself I would want to do more corporate PR. And fortunately, I was employed by the Electricity Company of Ghana as the regional PR head for Western Region. And then I also maintained a weekend program on Sky. So it's the most authoritative weekend news analysis program called News Review. And it's something I, I also do. Uh, so yes, I mean, I began with broadcasting and then I ended in public relations, but I still do broadcasting as a part-time thing. And so take us through growing up. Where did you grow up? How I was growing up? I, I grew up in Elubo. Elubo is a border town here in the Western region. Uh, it's more like Ghana's border town into La Côte d'Ivoire here on the West Coast. So that's where I grew up. I went to the New Generation Complex School in Elubo. Along the line, I moved to Kumase and I I attended Peter's Educational Center in Kwada, so I came back to Elubo and completed GHS there in Elubo. So that's where my mom is currently as we speak. And from there, I, I, I came to St. John's School here in Sekendi before I left for the University of Ghana. So yes, basically, I grew up in Elubo, quite a modest background, uh, a middle class background more like, and then so we had to we had to struggle somewhere along the line through school because I remember when when I joined when I came to St John's School my dad passed away in Form One uh, specifically 3rd December 1999 uh, that was when my dad passed away and you know we had to struggle a bit through school but God was gracious enough my mom was able to see us through and then the rest the rest is history. So let's look at. What, you've traveled far and near, uh, you've traveled across the Western region, mm. every length and breadth mm. of the Western region. What, what inspires you? Yeah, I think what, what inspires me to do what I do is the potential of the Western region. I mean, 
because of the rule, I mean, uh, I've been able to travel to every corner of the Western region, every district, every major town in the Western every. region, every, every major town in the Western region. I've, I've been there from, from Elubo through Halfasni to Eziyama, Inase, uh, Takwa, Bogoso, you move to Juaboso, Enchi, Asanpegua, Bibieni, Esam Debiso, and all those areas. I've, I've, I've been there, Sefia Contumbra, and, all, and, all, and even Bodhi, you know, and all those areas have been there. So I've, I've, I've lived through the good, the bad, and the ugly as far as the Western region is concerned. And t tell you what, this is a region with enormous potential. I, I was fortunate to also be the moderator of the, of the Made in UNDP Human Development Forum here in the Western region. It culminated in the publication of the first ever human development report, first ever in Ghana for any region. So the UNDP did one for the Western region for the first time. And if you, if you are fortunate to read the report, it tells you on the kind of stunted growth we've had as a region. And basically it's because of the, of the lack of opportunities for majority of the youth in the region. There are enormous potentials, enormous opportunities out there here in the region. But it seems there is a disconnect you know, between the opportunities and, and the youth. And that is what stood out for me really as I moderated the Human Development Forum. And it was, it was one thing that led us into organizing the Youth Entrepreneurship Summit to make sure we bridge that gap, make sure we, we introduce and expose the youth to the various opportunities here. So that's, that's what inspires me, the, the fact that I know things can change, the fact that I know we have a generation of youth now who are prepared to move the Western region from its current level to, to the next level. And I look at guys like you and other guys and the kind of stuff you guys are doing, uh, coupled with what some of us are doing, I think the, the future looks really bright for, for, for the Western region. A lot of people say opportunities in the Western region. Well, can you mention about three of them? Because it's 1030 to say the opportunities in the Western region. What exactly are the opportunities? Yeah, the, the opportunities are that, I mean, if you take a look at the mere fact that the Western region is the natural resource hub of the, of the country is in itself an opportunity. I mean, it depends on what you want to look at as an opportunity. Mostly, we, we look at challenges for what they are as challenges. But I would want to look at a challenge, look deep into that challenge, and in there, there would be an opportunity. So, I mean, what's the biggest challenge of the, of the Western region. The challenge is that it's very much naturally resourced. Paradoxically, it's also one of the poorest regions in the country. It doesn't simply make sense. That means there is something not gone right in there. And we would have to find out that thing, tweak it a bit, and things, things will come back. So I'm looking at opportunities in Agbrek because the, the, the arable lands all over, huge, you know, for the West. Unfortunately, the, the illegal mining, Galamse phenomenon, has devastated a lot of our arable land. But there are still a lot of them. I mean, you move entering the Western region from Komenda Edna Guafu, when you enter through Shama, I mean, the lands all over are good for sugarcane, they are good for rice, and, and all of that. So, yes, it's, it's an opportunity for the youth to go into agribusiness. And the value chain in agriculture is huge. The potentials in there are extremely huge. We have rainfall throughout the year, you know, in the, in the Western region. So it, it's a huge potential in there. Quite apart from crop farming, there's also animal husbandry, animal farming, uh, tilapia. I know friends who've gone into poultry farming and they are doing extremely well. And fortunately for us, I mean, because also of the natural resources here, a lot of the extractive companies feel the need to want to give back to society. So I know of interventions from TALO into, into a lot of livelihood alternative programs geared towards Agric. And guys like Bibovida championing, championing that. And when you look at what Bibovida has done, I mean, for every youth who is passionate about going into agribusiness. You don't really need to reinvent the wheel. I mean, you can contact some of these guys and they will give you, you know, that startup knowledge you, 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 you need. So yes, the, the opportunities are all over. 
you take even the oil. I mean, we all focus on the upstream oil industry. And I mean, an FPSO can take maximum 120 people. So the opportunities midstream, the opportunities downstream are huge. And that's where some of us should, should, be, should be looking at. So basically, I started my PR firm to, to, to be that local indigenous PR company in the Western region. And the idea really was to be that, that PR firm, some of these extractive companies will consult. I mean, this is what we would want to do. How do you think we should do it? And I leverage the extensive network I've built across the region because of my current role and also my, my job as a broadcaster, you know, to help some of these organizations. I think that's the thinking a lot of us, the youth, should, should have. The mindset should change and we should begin looking at some of those opportunities. I mean, you, we recently attended the, the launch of the Rig World Training School and that's what a young Ghanaian, I mean, in his 30s, has, has done and he's... he's, he's put up a $2 million investment, which is huge. $8 million. It's even $8 million. An $8 million investment, that's huge. And he's a 30, 35, 36-year-old guy, you know. So, I mean, if, if we looked at some of these opportunities, which are available anyway, with the right connections, the right network, the right resources, we can, we can. and that's why I'm, 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 I'm hopeful about the future of the rest. So when I see the opportunities, I really know what I'm talking about. Coming to you live from Annabelle's inside Chapel Hill in Takra Day. This is extensive chat. And we are refreshed by Salbi Fusta and we are sponsored by PK Worldwide, Chris Land TV, and a host of sponsors. I'm still talking to Philip Osebo, so he's the PRO of Electricity Company of Ghana and a broadcaster in the Western region's biggest medium, Sky Power FM. Um, let's look at public relations. Yes. Why should a corporation hire a PRO? I think the, the job of the PR officer, mostly the, the conflict is a conflict with marketing. So people see PR as marketing. But marketing really focuses on sales. You know, so on how the product would be able to get to the, to the customers. Why the need for the customer to buy product. But if the customer should take the product and there is a problem as a result of he or she taking the product, it hurts the image of the company that produces this. And that is where the PR comes in. So the job of the PR officer is to manage the corporate image of the organization. And you can do that through various forms. I mean, a lot... What, what we all know, really, I mean, the, the traditional thing or the conventional thing we all know is, oh, PR is the Wafrewa on the radio, don't know what Akasa, in the Wafrewa, oh, they know what they do, and they know what they do, and all of that. So that's, that's what we all know to be. But PR really goes beyond that. If, if you want to look at the real functions and activities of a PR officer, I mean, I do media relations, I do community relations, I do issues management, I do crisis communication, I do event management for my company, uh, I do stakeholder engagement, we do environmental scanning, and that's probably the most important thing a PR officer would have to do. Because mind you, when you meet your management team, you are the expert prescriber. And in, in PR terms, when we say expert prescriber, you are the person who is consulted when there is any issue that borders on the image of your organization. So your CEO will call you. I just read this story in the newspaper, and I think it's, it's a bit damaging. What do we do? And you have to think of your feet and make sure things happen. Your preoccupation as a PR person is to make sure that anything that would affect the image of your company, that hurts the image of your company, you make sure you stop it. So generally, in business schools, we learn SWOT analysis. So you look at your strengths, you look at your weakness, you look at the opportunities, you look at the threats. But in PR, we do what we call TOWS analysis, so T-O-W-S. So we look at the threats first. You understand? So what is it that threatens the image of your company? That is one thing you always have to look out for. So in the morning, when I get to the office, 
and my newspapers for the day are handed over to me, I go through every newspaper page by page to make sure there is no single story in there that, that is damaging to the reputation of my company. And if there are a lot of positive stories in there, then it means you are, you are, you are, you are, doing, you are doing your work. So, yes, basically, if you ask of what public relations is about, this is what it is. But I think people should begin disabusing their minds from the fact that, oh, PR is the Akushia and Yeah, I, mean, uh, I was even about to ask yeah. you, people, would I be right to say PROs are spin doctors? Spin doctrine is, is part of propaganda. You know, propaganda is, it depends on how you use it, it is that, it's either positive or negative, you understand. Uh, so people have used propaganda for, because there are some campaigns you embark on, some PR advocacy you do that you need a certain level of propaganda. Some marketing campaigns you do, you need a certain level of propaganda. You know, so spin doctrine falls under 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 that. There is there there are a lot of tools we use as PR officers, depending on the kind of campaign we are embarking on, and then the effect we want to create on our on our audience. You know, there are so many tools we use, but it's not just spin doctrine. It's not an avenue to spew lies and falsehood. I mean, one tenet of the one principle and the key ethic in the profession is to be as honest and truthful as much as possible. Because imagine if you are found out to have lied on a particular issue, you are rather deepening that that hurt as far as the image of your company is concerned. So you will not want to do that as a PR person. You just have to be honest as much as possible. Make sure you are truthful to your audiences. It doesn't hurt to apologize when you have to. Yeah, but in one of the um, PR journals, yes. it says PR people hardly apologize. It depends on who. I mean, I don't think it's a, it's a general practice across the profession. And but you are, you are considered brave and bold if you apologize as a PR person. You are. You are. I mean, and it, it's, like, it's like when a radio station calls you, on an issue and you have no information on that issue. It doesn't hurt asking for permission to go back and come, you know, go for more information and then and come and speak. It doesn't mean because you are the PR when you are called on any issue, you just go on air and, and talk. So it's the same thing. If it gets to a point where you have to apologize, I remember in, in ECG there was a time where we had a problem with our, with our network, the prepaid vending network. So there were queues all over the metropolis. I mean, I get to the office around 7 and I'm told, there are people who join the queue in front of the regional office. I mean, the queue was from the regional office to, it was close to Prestige, all need Prestige supermarket. Oh. So it tells you how long the queue was. I mean, people queued from 3 a.m. just to get in there and buy prepaid credit. It was, it was a messy situation, you know. But we were able to manage it, in, in, it to, some, to some extent. I mean, I went on air and I apologized. We, we know we work with machines. They can break down any time. It's, it's, it's not your doing. I mean, if today there should be a major storm and all our lines should come down that lead to outages in some critical areas in the metropolis, it is not my doing. So you just have to come on air and then apologize to your customers. But then you reassure them and give, give let, them, let them feel that indeed you're doing something to resolve the, the, the challenges you complain about. And I think once you do that, so you don't have to allow a disconnect between the reality and what you're saying. So if you're saying you are doing this to provide supply and all of that, when the people come to the ground, they should see your men on the ground working. You know, so it's not as if you are on air saying one thing and then your guys are also doing that. That's why over the past few years, we've really focused very much and on customer service to make sure that what we say on air isn't different from what the reality is on the ground. So it's, it's, it's a complete mix. You have to look at it holistically and you would enjoy public relations. And what's the biggest crisis, if, uh, I mean, crisis, um, what's it called? Yeah, the, the biggest crisis, crisis are hard to handle. handle yes. I think in, in ECG, that was it. I mean, when our, 
when our system, the, the prepaid vending system broke down, it was, it was messy. It was messy. I mean, that was when I, I did over 10 interviews in a day. It was crazy. So what were some of the questions they were asking you? Were they I mean, angry? The point is, people are in queues with money. And they want to buy prepaid credit. And there is, you are unable to serve them. So, yes, it, it, it heightens their tension, it heightens their anxiety and their, their, their anger. So that's what I call crisis. It's real PR crisis. And you have to do something to make sure. But fortunately for us, I mean, we, we got our communication on point. We're able to bring our customers into what we are doing. So for the first time, we provided canopies at our car park. We provided chairs for our customers to sit on. We provided them water. And we made sure we created a lot of vending points. So when you come to the original office today, you would find about four or five vending points. But during the crisis, we created five additional to be able to serve people. So these are the things you do practically for the customers to see that you are working hard to rectify the, 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 the challenge at hand. Before ECG and joining ECG, what have you gathered? Or about the public, the perception about ECG out there was oh, light of um, ECG doom. So, what has shocked you? After yeah, you? I think what 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 really shocked me was the was the general lack lack of understanding on the part of the Ghanaian people about our own power sector. And I must admit, I mean, before until I joined ECG, I myself didn't know a lot of the stuff I know now. I mean, the fact that there are clear-cut responsibilities in the power sector, i.e. generation, transmission, distribution, and regulation. I mean, for me, I knew a bit about that because I had to interview people from the power sector on my show back at Sky. So I had to take it upon myself to listen. But after I joined ECG, I realized, I mean, majority of the Ghanaian people didn't know. So it, it came as a shocker to me. But I think we, we, we used we used the load shedding crisis period to educate a lot of Ghanaians about how the power sector operates and ECG's role in Ghana's power sector. And I look back and I think, yes, I mean, there, there is no bad publicity. Sometimes, even in the midst of that crisis, you can, you can turn things around and get what you want. So we used that period to really educate the Ghanaian people. And I remember it was during that period that I really traveled across the Western region, because I had to hold community debates in every district. In every district, you do not less than five communities in every district. So community debates, you stand on your feet, talk for over four hours. The other is, after your presentation, there are questions and answers. People were angry. People were really angry because, I mean, there was, there was that lack of information. So I, I joined ECG at that time, and I remember my friends tell me, I mean, why do you want to join ECG in the midst of the crisis? And I tell them, I mean, that is where I, I think I'll be valued as a PR officer. Because if there is no crisis, if things are moving smoothly, I mean, who needs a PR anyway, you know? So, of course, I mean, you would need a PR to do more of the proactive PR. But when you would have to react to a crisis, that's where... Your, your, you, you feel your real value. So it was at that time that I think we also worked hard to change a lot of the perceptions about, about the power sector in Ghana. We are still talking to Philip Osebonso, and he's a public relations officer of ECG, Western Region, and a broadcaster. And we've not spoken about Sky. Yes. As a morning show host mm -hmm. and a PR for ECG, mm -hmm. which one do you enjoy most? I think I enjoy both. I, I am passionate about possible? radio. Yes, it is. It is. And the fact is, one key function of a PR officer is media relations. Mm -hmm. So you would want to mostly stay relevant in the media. Um, that depends on your relationship with the media. So the, the fact that I still work as a, as a media person you know, gives me that, that leverage. So I am, I am on several media platforms. I, I serve on a committee at the GG. I'm a member of the Ghana Journalists Association, the Western Regional Branch. So it helps. And yes, as 
probably which one was most challenging. Uh, I think the the ECG job because mostly we we are faced with a lot more crisis with a lot more inquisition from our customers and all of that and even from the media you would always want to be on point you would always want to think outside the box what should i do different how do i engage the media how do i relate to my stakeholders and all of that so yes it's it's it, it's very challenging on sky i think i we left our mark by the grace of god we did we did the best we could do to lift the morning show from where it was to where, where we left off. And I must admit, the, the, the man who took over for me, Kojo Grace, has also done a human's job. I think together with Parkway Systems, and they've held the fort really, really well. Occasionally, I go back on holidays to host the show, which is very exciting uh, for, for, for me. But my, my, my Sky story is, is a story that should inspire everybody. I mean, I, I joined Sky as, as an ordinary sports presenter. And after, after a two, main presenter or a panel member? No, I was a presenter. I presented tidbits. I mean, we had what we call the sports journal. It was it was a segment on the drive. I was I was presenting that I had a, a time slot on TV as well uh, in the six a.m. news that I presented sports. And I also joined the various discussion programs as a present as a panelist. You know, uh, but after two years, I, I I was hosting the morning show. You know, I think in twenty ten. And the story was the, the actual host of the show went on leave, and I was asked to step in. Uh, and after a month, when he came back, managers of the station said no, they will not allow him to come so, back to the show. So how was that? You know the main host is out and now being put on that seat, yeah. and he is back, yeah. and they are telling you to continue. Didn't you feel some kind of... It was, it was a difficult did period. Did you feel betrayed? It was, it was a difficult period, managing that. But I think the... The we all owed allegiance to the Sky brand. I mean, the the idea was to sell the brand. What would make the Sky brand win is it was not about our personal idiosyncrasies. I mean, if if it was for for us, I would have said, oh, okay. I mean, since it's your show, but if management, after all their research and all of that, thought I was winning on the show, I mean, we should we should focus more on the bigger picture. Than our individual defense. So yes, initially it was it was difficult, but later I thought it was one of those things, and I focused on rather building building the show. Who were some of the prominent people you interviewed on that morning show? I think I interviewed almost every every prominent person you can think about. I interviewed President Kofo. I interviewed Anna Apofuado. I interviewed then candidate Mahama. I I interviewed everybody. I mean. Almost everybody I can, everybody who is newsworthy, who, who makes the news in Ghana, was on the show. And we positioned the show as the mouthpiece of the Western region. So no big player would come to the Western region without appearing on the Sky JBS. That was, that was what we wanted to achieve. Unfortunately, we were able to achieve that. And because we, were, we ran simultaneously on radio and TV, it was something we really leveraged. To, because we had the audience share, and our competition was clear. We were competing with stations that picked programs from Accra. You know. So we had to really position the brand. So our, our brand positioning was to make Sky the mouthpiece of the West. And that's how we came with the tagline, the Western Regions Radio Station. It was, it was a well thought through brand positioning thing we did. I remember when I went to the UK, uh, Mr. Wilson Arthur called that they would want to come up with a different tagline for Sky. What do I think? And I said, I believe we've gotten to a point where, yes, everybody knows we are the mouthpiece of the West, the first private radio station in the Western region. But we have to speak it. We have to communicate it. It should, it should be heard on the, on the radio station. So I told him we should use the Western Regions Radio Station, and we then rolled out new liners and, and jingles for that, and it, it, it caught up like, like something. So you've interviewed all the prominent people. Which interview do you still remember? Which interview still rings a bell in your mind that this is one of the interviews I won't ever forget? <laughs> that's, that's an interesting question. I think it's, there were too many very good interviews, so it's, it's difficult when you have to choose one. But I enjoyed speaking to 
Captain Kudu, the then MC of the Metropolis. He was a PR person, mm -hmm. so he, he made interviews fun. And one thing we did with him was, because we focused a bit more on local issues, so he was an ardent listener of the show. And every now and then he would call in, oh, we have heard this on your station, I want to make an input and all of that. So it was fun speaking with him. And I think I enjoyed speaking to ex-president Kufo. Because, I mean, he was then ex-president and he came across as that quintessential statesman and everybody would want to speak to and all of that. So when, I, when my producer told me we have President Kufo, it was on his birthday actually. You know, so we had President Kofu on the line. I was like, wow. And one, one of the things as a morning show host is you always have to think on the beat because your producer can just enter the studio with an interview. So you have no time to say, okay, I'm going to research, you're going to do this and all of that. But once the, the, the interviewee is on the line, you have to go and make sure you kill it. And that's, that's some of the things. I, and I think I remember the interview with Nanado as well. I mean, he was, he was then kind of, I think he had come to Takwa, so we had to move to Takwa to get, to get that interview. And I think it was him and Baumia, it was, it was an awesome interview. Yeah. So how do you prepare as a morning show host? Because morning show hosts are considered one of the smartest, and if not the flagship people yeah. on the radio, on every medium. How do you prepare as a morning show? How were you preparing them? I think you read. Uh, you should be passionate about what you do, number one. You should love what you do. And then you read, you learn. It's, that is the only distinguishing factor. You have to learn, you have to be on top. You should know, sometimes know more than even the people you are interviewing. So you are not led astray. Because one embarrassing thing is, is, is to provide your platform to people to spew propaganda without being in the position to checkmate them, to make sure, hey, you said that it's not true, here are the facts and all of that. And that's one thing I dreaded the most. So I made sure every now and then I'm always on top of the issues. And one thing that, that, that made us stand out was uh, our interviewing scale. I mean, we, we made sure we took our interviews serious. So we asked the relevant questions, the questions listeners would expect you as a host to answer. You know, because you are doing the show for your for your listeners, so you should you should be able to gauge their expectations and the questions you think they would love to to answer. You should be in that position to ask those questions for them, and that's basically what what we did. So, learning, reading, always making sure we are we are on top of the issue. That was that was that was my preparation, and I remember one thing I took serious of my intro. So how you introduce the program, the song you play, and all of that. And I was I was fortunate enough that mostly at dawn, when 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 I wake up at dawn on my bed, that's where I think creatively, you know, about how to start the show, the song I should use, the memory verse I should quote from the Bible, what I should say around the memory, just to get people up. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole idea was to get people out there, go out there, and work. And let her build Madagascar. What's the best question you've ever asked? Do I have one? Do I have one? Do I have one? Do I have one? I think I've, 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 I've asked more. But I remember I was speaking to PCRP on an, on an issue, and I asked a question, and he was like, Wow, he is granted so many interviews on that issue, and no journalist in the whole of the country has asked that question. So when I, when I, when I asked the question, he, he paused a bit and he came back and he said, young man, you are very intelligent. So I remember that day, Mr. Wells Nata opened the door of the studio and did this to me, you know. So I was like, okay, then, then, then it, was, it was a good feeling. Was it question? was a really good feeling. I, I honestly don't remember. It was on one of these his, his corruption issues. I, 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 I don't recall the question readily, but I think it was it was, it was good. I mean, I, there were so many good questions we asked. I don't, I don't think I can pick one All right. apart from this. Philip doesn't think he can think one. We're still talking to Philip Osebon, the PR of Electricity Company of Ghana and a broadcaster with Sky Media Group. We are refreshed by Salbi Fusta and we are sponsored by PKE Worldwide.
Crestline TV, Two TV Times dot com, and a host of sponsors. I know the viewers won't forgive me if we don't delve into his personal life. So let's go straight to your personal. You are married now. Yeah, I am. When? I am. Can we have a drink? Yeah, we can have a drink. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, this is from Chess. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, that's that's coco meal from mm. Salvi. How do you find it? It's good. You really like good. It? I like it. I like it. Mm -hmm. I like so it. So that's um, I recommend it for you, Salvi yeah. Boosters Coco Meal. Yeah. You could contact us and we'll make sure you have as many as you want. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about personal life. Yeah. You are married now. I'm married. When? How many years? So I'm married in 2016, February 2016. Specifically the twentieth of February 2016. And a father? I'm a father, yes, a father to a fantastic baby boy. What's his name? So you decided not to give him any English name? Was it intentional, deliberate? I'm, I'm not English, I'm Ghanaian. So, but you have, you have Philip? Yeah, I have Philip. If so I, if you had the opportunity? If I had my way, I would have changed it. To? To a local name. What would that be? My, mm -hmm. my local name is Kweku mm -hmm. So would that be Kweku Kwatim or Saibon, so yes. How has father would change it? I, my whole life is, is to impact. I mean, I believe that's what life is about, to, to impact. Jesus said we are, we are the light of the world. That is impact, you know. So, yes, I'm a Christian. I would want to make heaven. But I also know I don't have to be too heavenly conscious and earthly useless. Because even the Bible said, Jesus in his model prayer to his disciples said, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven so god would want to would want the earth really to be like heaven you know and he would do that through people like us to make sure we make the world a better place to leave a legacy in this world and that's basically what i would want to leave my kid so fatherhood has made me more responsible made me more aware of my of my responsibility to make sure I leave that legacy with my kid because I know people who have benefited from the legacies of their parents. I mean, they, they, they really did not do anything to get to where they are, but because of what their parents did, the legacies their parents left, you know, so they, 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 they enjoy what they are enjoying. And that's basically what I would want to do for my kid. Not only him, but kids in his generation. Yeah, you're talking about legacy. What's that one legacy you would want Nana Peku to grow up to hear about his father, Philip Osewonsu? Yeah, that his father left a mark on the world. That his father impacted his world positively. That, that his father, when the name of his father is mentioned, it hits the minds of people. I mean, I don't want to be that, that person who who when you are gone, when you are no more, people will not remember you for anything. I want to be remembered for something. And that's, that's what my whole life has been about, has been about impact. So what I've done on radio, what I've done with, with ECG, what I've done with my personal life has been to impact the region I am from and also Ghana and Africa. So that's, that's my focus. Is there anybody who has impacted you strongly? Is there any role model? Who do you look up to? I think role models are people who have done exactly what you want to do, you know. So out, my role model is Jesus Christ, you know, and the reason is simple. He lived for 33 years. His ministry was for three years, three years, you know, but he's made the biggest impact every man living or dead can make, you know. So he's my role model, that's one. But I have mentors. So mentors are people who inspire you, people you look up to. And you can have mentors for different stuff. So a mentor on your finances, how you want to manage your finances, your okay, marriage, so let's take it one your by job, one. And entrepreneurship. Mr. Wilson Arthur. Um, ministry, because you speak about Jesus yeah. and yeah. Christianity. Yeah. And not Christianity. Yeah, ministry. I think the, the current chairman of the Church of Pentecost inspires me a lot. You're a member of the Pentecost? Yes, I'm a member of the Church of Pentecost. Um, journalism? Journalism, uh, locally I love Sefakai, internationally 
I enjoyed, you know, my, my pride was one of the things we enjoyed in the UK was seeing Pamela Dumont on TV. It was like the, the, the big thing. When you go, you go, you know, in, in corporate communications, we did media industries. So in the media industries class, I mean, the other Africans would, oh, okay, we saw Kamala Dumont, we saw, and all of that. So it was, it was a moment of pride for some of us back in the, back in the UK. So he, he inspired us to want to push the elements, to really push, to really push the elements. So internationally, yes, I would say, I would say him and a host of others. Pierre, uh, in PR profession. Right? Yeah, in PR, that's a big one. That's, that's a really big one. But I think Mauna Dumo does well. Kamala's sister. Kamala's sister does well. She speaks well. She, she knows her stuff and all of that. And my, and my boss in ECG, Mr. William Watting, solid professional, solid leader. I mean, if, if you've seen that new phase of ECG, of communication in ECG, then you credit, you credit him. He's, he's an amazing leader. You know, ECG recently won two major awards from the GITTA you know, awards night. So we won the best MDA on social media. We won the best MDA. So the best, M the MDA with the best corporate website. Mm -hmm. We also won that that particular one. So yes, we are. We've done a lot to change staff, and I think he he should be credited for that. And his his style of leadership and everything inspires me a lot as a as a professional PR. So you are a Talo scholar. Yes. How did you get that? Because I know it's for the smartest brains yeah. in Ghana yeah. and even across Africa. How did you get that scholarship? Okay, let me say in 2012, I was privileged to interview staff of the British Council. Mm -hmm. They were here in the Western region and then they came on the show. Mm -hmm. So apparently they were there to talk about a scholarship package by Talo. I mean, we are all in the Western region, we've heard of Talo as the lead operators and all of that. I, I must admit, I didn't know about the scholarship package until the British Council came. So after the interview, I, I was like, okay, this, this is an opportunity. Because I had begun applying for uh, master's degree programs in the UK and the US with, with some schools and some of them I've, I've, I've gotten some of them but the, right. the funds was, 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 was a problem so after the interview I was like okay I would, I would give this a shot so I applied fortunately I, I made it through the first phase because I we were later to realize that there were over 7,000 applications and how many were they choosing? 50. Even so the 50. Less than 1%. Yeah, even the 50, 10 were assured because 10 were drawn from the ministries, department, and agencies linked to the oil industry. So we had to sort, slug it out for the remaining 40. Uh, unfortunately, they dedicated 10 slots for indigenous of the Western region. So I applied through the Western region route. And it was an extremely competitive process extremely competitive. I mean, we had around five different interviews, five different stages. Moving to the British Council, they sometimes would come here to Takrade for some of the interviews and all of that. But eventually, we, we made it through the, the, the 50 that left Ghana in September 2012 for the UK. I was privileged to be in the oil capital of Europe, Aberdeen, in Scotland. And I schooled at the Robert Gordon University, Aberdeen Business School, and as I said earlier, for an MSc in Corporate Communications and Public Affairs. So that's, that's the Talo story. I mean, amazing, amazing story. And that, that was when I began seeing... Did the Talo scholarship change anything in your life? Yeah, it did. It did. What I did think it? it was after the scholarship that I, I thought I had, I had really come of age to get into corporate PR because I uh, studied corporate communications and of course backed by my media background, I thought I was, I was ripe for a career in public relations. But for, but for the scholarship, I don't think I would have, I would have gotten that. And, and from the training we had in the UK, it ignited the, the spirit of entrepreneurship in us. So I remember back in the UK, together with four other colleagues, we, we started a think tank called VM Africa registered in Scotland, you know, and I, I was privileged to be one of the directors of that company. 
and back in Ghana, I also founded OBPR Consult, which is a public relations firm, you know, that, that provides that strategic PR advice to, to our clients. So, yes, that's what the UK did for me. One, it, it gave me a career. Two, it also made me an entrepreneur, basically. So, is VM celebrating? Is it active? Yeah, it's, it's, it's now changed to the, the Institute of Education Studies. Yes. So you're a Mandela Washington fellow as well? Yes. Is that the, you went through the same process as the Talu Scholarship? Or what, what yeah, the Mandela Washington Fellowship is the flagship program of the Young African Leadership Initiative. And it was established by President Barack Obama in 2014. So the idea is to build the next generation of African leaders. You know, so every year, uh, some young African leaders are sent to the UK, uh, to the US, sorry. And it's it's a program wholly funded by the U.S. State Department. You know. So I was privileged to be part of the 2017 cohort. Forty of us made it through in Ghana. And again, with that, there was also around 4,088 applications. You know, and they were taking just 40. So it was also another extremely competitive. But of course, I mean, because of our experiences working with the British Council and all of that, it gave us you know, that confidence to, to face those interviews. And fortunately, we, we made it through that, and it was also another life-changing experience. I mean, we, we spent six weeks in the U.S. of A uh, on, on our, the academic track. I was privileged to be on the business and entrepreneurship track at the University of San Diego. I mean, one of the, one of the most beautiful places on earth. I mean, it's, it's, it's an extremely beautiful campus they have there. You know, so we were, we were there, and then... We were able to finish the course, got our certificate, came to Washington, D.C. for the three-day presidential summit. And I was privileged to be an Ignite speaker. So as part of the fellowship, each school would present one fellow as an Ignite speaker to speak on a topic the fellow is passionate about. So you speak in front of thousand other young Africans. It was it was an amazing experience. And I spoke on my passion, which is entrepreneurship. So the, the, the fact that the greatest challenge Africa as a continent faces is job creation for, for the youth. You know probably better than I do uh, that we are currently, we currently have the youngest population in the world with, with a median age of 20. You know. the, the scary bit is by 2035, that's 18 years from now, more than half of all new job seekers in the world will be Africans. You know? And that means Africa would have to create 1.8 billion new jobs in the next 18 years. So that's, that's like a huge task for our continent. But I think we can do the right advocacy, make sure we, 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 we push the right information out there, put the right pressure on our government, to, to pay a bit more attention on that. It's even scary when you look at the situation in Ghana. I mean, the last research from the World Bank put the unemployed, the youth unemployment a percentage at forty eight percent, you know, in, in Ghana. That's that's huge. Yeah. And recently it it was clear that after national service, only ten percent of university graduates get real employment after national service, only ten percent. So it means Yes, we would have to do more to create decent jobs for our youth. We would have to also do more to build entrepreneurs who can create their own jobs and job for other young people. And that's basically why we began the Youth Entrepreneurship Summit here in the Western region. And it's something we would want to continue and, and, and do more. So yes, the, the YALI project, the Mandela Washington Fellowship, was another awesome, awesome experience I had. So choose one, Talibu Scholarship and the Mandela Washington I'll, I'll choose both. No, you choose one. <laughs> Putting you on the spot to choose one. <laughs> that would be a difficult one, because I think each, each came with its own benefits. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the, the UK was awesome. I, I always say it, it was the best one year in my life, mm -hmm. because we lived like what people would say that are bees in the UK. I mean, a young, a young man with that much money in a foreign land in, in the UK. So it was, it, was, it was a good experience and awesome. It opened me up to the world out there. 
we built lasting relationships with other young Africans, friends in Nigeria, in South Africa, and, and everywhere. The thing about the Mandela Washington Fellowship is, I mean, you know, you've gotten to a level where Africa looks up to you. You are now a young African leader, you know. So it's more like the things you used to do, you can no longer do them now. You know the world is watching, Africa is watching. And mind you, I was also named as part of 30 young Ghanaians in the new yeah, Accra magazine. magazine. You know, so the young, 30 young Ghanaians who are, who are about to hit the world, shake the world yeah. to shake the world and all of that. So if you are in that bracket, it, it, it puts a responsibility on you they bring to any pressure? about reproach and all of that. A bit, a bit. I mean, because you know, people will call you, oh, okay, you are a mentor, we look up to you and all of that. So you would have to live about the approach. And I think it, it built me in, in, a certain, in a certain way. Um, so let's finish on this note. I'll mention a name and you use one word to describe the person. Well, Sonata. Smart. Western region. Mm. Potential. Social media. Great. Journalism in Ghana. You said only a word, right? Yeah, one word. Just one word. Just one word. To describe journalism in Ghana. <laughs> Why has it taken you this long? Oh, no, no, no. Journalism I mean, in Ghana. Journalism in Ghana has. Okay, just one word. Mm -hmm. I'll say it's good. Potential of Ghana. Super. Nana Kofado. He's a leader, good leader. John Mahama. He's done his part. Robert Mugabe. One of Africa's rare... No, that's a sentence. One word. <laughs> oh, it was a sentence. Yeah. Okay, so he's a revolutionary. Philip Osebonsi. A product of grace. What was that product of grace? Could you explain briefly so that we end on the Yeah, I think I, I, I am what I am because of grace. I recognize the fact that beyond the grace of God, success in every endeavor responds to works and not wishes. But there is a part grace place. You know, so even Apostle Paul said it in Corinthians that he, he, he is the least of the apostles and he is even not qualified to be called an apostle. But because of the grace of God on him. But he continued to say that the grace of God was not in vain because he labored than them all. And that's how come Paul had to walk for 12,000 miles preaching the gospel. So Paul recognized the place of hard work in there, even with grace. You know, but as I said, grace will connect you to divine opportunities. But for, but for the grace of God, you might not have seen those opportunities. But the grace will take you there. The grace will add wisdom to you to be able to make good use of that opportunity and do something out, out of that. So my life, everything I've done with my life has been a result of This has been Extensive Chat and our slogan is inspiring you and telling real stories. We hope we did with the story of Philip Osem, Philip Osebunsu, the hero of ECG and a broadcaster. Philip, cheers. Mm. So toast to, toast to long, life. long life, more impact, more impact. and more grace. More grace. <laughs> Bye.